All right, Professor, what are, you, what, are you, what are we talking about today? I was going to talk about a paper entitled Gaia Early Data Release 3, Acceleration of the Solar System from Gaia Astrometry. Professor, you're loving all these findings that are coming out of Gaia, aren't you? It's a brilliant mission. And, and actually, you know, I think the best is yet to come because it's the nature of this telescope. Its sole ambition is to measure the positions of about a billion stars and various other objects in space and to continue to monitor them. And the primary science goal is to measure this phenomenon called parallax, which is basically as the satellite, as it's orbiting the Earth, the Earth goes around the sun, which means it's sort of viewing the nearby universe from different places. And in doing so, it's viewing things from slightly different directions. You end up seeing the stars move a little bit. And the classic way of illustrating this is it's the same phenomenon as if you hold your finger up in front of your nose and then close one eye and close the other eye and your finger jumps just because your eyes are viewing it from slightly different directions and the further your finger is away from your face, the less your finger jumps when you make that, uh, do that little experiment. Professor, this might say something about me, but I remember like, you know, when Hubble went up and we would talk about James Webb and there's so much hype and excitement. I feel like I don't even remember Guy going up. I don't remember people talking about it. It just kind of one day you started telling me, wow. look at all this amazing data. And I'm like, where does this come from? Stop, décollage. I guess it's partly because it's a little bit more specialised. And astrometry, you know, it's a, it's a classic subject. And for the longest time, it made very little progress. But then we first had this mission called Hipparchos in the 1990s, and then Gaia is kind of the successor to that, which have kind of completely revolutionised what these telescopes could do, the accuracy of the missions. What's this paper telling us? So we, we need to back up a little bit first. Um, and I need to talk about a, 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 a bit of astronomy called stellar aberration. It sort of came with the birth of, of uh, people trying to measure parallax. So back in the 18th century, there was a guy called Bradley, James Bradley was his name, who was trying to measure the distances to stars from this parallax effect. And what he actually found is that the stars do indeed move over the course of a year, but in completely the wrong pattern for it to be the parallax effect and by far too large an amount. And what he did uncovered was this phenomenon called stellar aberration. And he was actually also the person not only who discovered it, but also came up with the explanation as to what's going on, why stars wobble around over the course of the year. And in essence, it comes down to, if you think about going out in the rain, like if the, and imagine the rain's falling straight down on your head. If you're standing still, the rain falls on your head and you can say, oh, the rain's coming from straight up. But if you start walking, then because there's now a relative motion between you and the rain, the rain actually starts hitting you in the face, right? If you're carrying an umbrella, you have to tilt your umbrella forward. You get exactly the same thing with stars, right? That actually the direction in which the starlight is coming depends on the direction in which the Earth's moving. If the Earth's not moving, then, you know, maybe the starlight will be coming from directly ahead. But if the Earth's moving, then the net effect of that is that the, the starlight appears to come from a slightly different direction just because you add the relative speeds together and you end up shifting the direction the light's coming from. And of course, over the course of a year, as the Earth goes around the sun, its motion is in different directions at different times, which means this effect shifts stars in different directions at different times of the year. So this guy, Bradley, figured all this out and actually he used it to make the first reasonably accurate measurement of the speed of light because it's all to do with you know the amount that this effect, uh, the size of this effect just depends on the relative speed of the Earth, which they knew, compared to the speed of light. Now, that story is not quite true because it turns out, of course, you, you can't do it. So this involved adding speeds, right? That I said, well, the speed of, you know, the things traveling at some speed and then there's the relative motion of the Earth. We added speeds together. One of those speeds we added together in this particular case was the speed of light. And you're not supposed to do that because you run into all sorts of relativistic effects that says actually when you get closer to the speed of light, you can't just add speeds together. So the, the real story is a little more complicated. And in fact, stellar aberration was what led to the formation, the formulation of special relativity. But at least in qualitative terms, this idea of thinking about it in terms of rain falling on your head still works pretty well. If we move forward to the 19th century, um, there was an astronomer called John Pond, who was also interested in parallax. And he pointed out an interesting thing, which is that that was just thinking about the Earth moving around the sun. But of course, if the sun's moving relative to the stars, then that should produce the same effect. What he pointed out is that if the sun were to accelerate or decelerate, so if its speed were to change, then actually that change in speed would lead to a change in this effect, just as if you sped, sped up or slowed down walking in the rain, and therefore you ought to see things move due to the acceleration or deceleration of the sun. A little bit later in the 19th century, John Herschel came along and said, that's all very well and it's a very neat idea. But of course, we now know, as they did by then, that the stars are all moving as well. They all have their own proper motions. So he said, you know, trying to separate out the motion due to the acceleration of the sun 
from just the fact that the stars are all moving around anyway, and we can now measure those, uh, is hopeless, right? You're never actually going to be able to do that. And the reason why suddenly it comes back to life again is Gaia is measuring the positions of billions of stars, but it's also measuring some other things as well. And in particular, there are about a million quasars that it's measuring. So these are these very distant galaxies with incredibly bright star-like output because their central engines, their central black holes are incredibly bright. So to all intents and purposes, they look just like stars, and so Gaia can measure them, but of course they don't move. Well, they probably do move, but they're such huge distances away that effectively they form an unmoving reference frame. That means that if Pond's original idea was right, and the sun were accelerating, then we should be able to detect it by looking for the aberration it induces in all these distant quasars. They'll all start to have a proper motion just due to the fact that the sun is accelerating over time. And so even though the signal in any one particular quasar is absolutely tiny, because we've got a million of them and we know what pattern to look for, we can kind of average all that information together to try and measure the acceleration of the sun. And that's what this paper did. All right. This brings me to the question that's been burning a hole in my head for the last five to 10 minutes. Why yep. is the sun accelerating at all? The main reason the sun's accelerating is because it's orbiting around the Milky Way. And of course, to get something to go around in a circle, you have to accelerate it. It's this phenomenon called centripetal acceleration. The movement there, because it's not traveling in a straight line, its velocity is changing. That means you're accelerating it. So we actually have a reasonable prediction as to what we expect the acceleration of the sun to be and also what direction we expect it to be in because centripetal acceleration, it's seeking the center, centripetal acceleration. So it's actually all should be accelerating towards the center of the galaxy. So that's the phenomenon that these guys measured. Let me just read the results. Our best estimates of the acceleration based on Gaia EDR3, so that's these data they look at, is 2.32 plus or minus 0 0.16 times 10 to the minus 10 meters per second squared. So it's an acceleration of 2 times 10 to the minus 10 meters per second squared. So that's a 0 with 0 0.902 meters per second squared. That's really small. That's absolutely tiny. It means over the course of a year, the speed of the sun changes by less than a centimetre per second. Where's the energy coming from to do that, from gravity? Yeah, it's just the pull of gravity. So it's the, the, the pull of gravity is what's pulling it around, accelerating it around. It's just Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration, where the force is the gravitational pull of the galaxy towards the centre, and the acceleration is the centripetal acceleration towards the centre. Now, the reason why it's tiny is you're, you're quite right. The actual acceleration on kind of astronomical timescales is quite large, but that's the thing. You have to accelerate it around in a circle over the course of 200 million years, right? the time it takes to go around. So that means the amount that the, the speed needs to change each second is absolutely tiny. So we think the sun's going around the Milky Way at something like 230 kilometers per second. We think we know the distance to the center. So actually we can predict what that acceleration more or less ought to be. It's probably a bit more complicated because there will be local effects, you know, that causing the sun to accelerate. There are nothing to do with that global acceleration. But actually it turns out that the number they get here is almost exactly the same as that figure you would expect. And then, of course, the last bit is I mentioned that not only do you get the size of the acceleration, you get the direction of the acceleration as well. And the direction is pointed right at the centre of the galaxy. So this is exactly what you'd expect for that kind of centripetal acceleration effect. So they've used all these stars and this guy data to calculate something they could have calculated pretty easily another way. You know, at some level, it's a trivial calculation because we sort of already knew what the answer is. It's sort of reassuring it gave the right answer. Technically, it is absolutely amazing that they can measure an acceleration, directly measure, you know, pre the, yeah. the previous, you know, we think the acceleration has to be this, was all indirectly inferred, right? They've measured it. They've measured this acceleration, this tiny acceleration. You want it to point and keep it there. And it's actually surprisingly simple physics, and it's all down to the conservation of angular momentum. Now, you might see in, in some science fiction shows like Battlestar Galactica or something like that, uh, that they maneuver spacecraft with thrusters.